At the beginning of chapter 6, Daniel is going along just fine. He is some 80 years old now, but he has not slowed down. Darius is now king of Babylon, and good news is that Daniel has found King Darius's favor. King Darius has made Daniel one of three administrators in the kingdom who report directly to him. Soon Daniel makes such an impression that Darius wants to set Daniel over the whole kingdom. And this is of course not such good news for Daniel's colleagues at Babylon. If you know politics, you will know that nobody wants to lose power. Daniel's promotion would mean for them just that. It would also mean a crackdown on all corruption, as Daniel, according to our text, was trustworthy and in no way corrupt. And I ask myself the question at this point, am I so, am I trustworthy and in no way corrupt? So, because of the impending loss of power and the loss of leeway for corruption, the other administrators and satraps find grounds to have Daniel charged with misconduct, or try to find grounds. But they cannot find any grounds, because, remember, Daniel is trustworthy and in no way corrupt. So, the plotters have to hatch another evil plan, and that is precisely what they do. They request the king to issue an edict that anyone who prays to any god or human being other than Darius for the next 30 days be thrown into the lion's den. Then they ask Darius to issue the decree and to put it into writing so that it cannot be altered, which was a rule according to the law of the Medes and Persians. So once issued, it would be cast in stone. Why did Darius issue this edict? Well, maybe he sought unity in the kingdom, or maybe he did not want to offend the plotters, or maybe he was just vain and liked the idea of being worshipped. The Bible does not tell us why. But we do know that Darius would come to regret it. Now, when Daniel heard of the decree, he promptly went home to his upstairs room and prayed. The Bible says that three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Now the words, just as he had done before, should be noted. The Bible is telling us something very important, namely that prayer was Daniel's habit and practice. And I ask myself, is prayer my habit and practice? He did not start praying suddenly because he was frightened of the consequences of the decree. Prayer was not a knee-jerk reaction. His prayer life had discipline, habit, and commitment. At 80, still unshakable. Again, I ask myself, does my prayer life have discipline, habit, and commitment? Now, unfortunately, our evil plotters saw Daniel praying and immediately went to see King Darius. They held Darius to his edict, and now Darius could not back out. And poor King Darius was greatly distressed. He liked Daniel. He did not want Daniel to die, but he couldn't back out because the law was the law. So Darius gave the order that Daniel be thrown into the den. And before they threw him in, the king said these important words to Daniel. May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. Notice this that King Darius himself says that Daniel continually serves God. Daniel's commitment to God was evident. And question to self, is my commitment to God evident to others? Now they threw him into the den of lions and sealed up the den, and King Darius went home and had a very sleepless night. The next morning, at the crack of dawn, the king ran to the lion's den, and when he came near to the den, he called in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? And then this wonderful voice answering Daniel's voice, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight. 
nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. Now you see, King Darius was overjoyed, and he raised Daniel from the pit, and Daniel had no mark on him. And at the king's command, those who had falsely accused Daniel were thrown into the pit along with their wives and children. Daniel's faithfulness leads to the glorifying of God. And I ask myself this question, does my life lead to the glorifying of God by others? King Darius wrote to all the nations and all the peoples of every language on all the earth and said the following, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Now this text teaches us, I believe, much about Christian Composure. Let me say that again. It teaches us much about Christian composure, about maturity, self-possession, calmness and tranquility as a Christian. You would have noticed from the text that Daniel was very calm and collected about the edict. He did not get emotional or frayed at the edges. Almost like Clint Eastwood in the Dirty Harry movies, you can hear Daniel say, Go ahead and make my day. Test me if you want. I know myself. And so Daniel went straight home and did what he always did. Went to his upper room where the windows were open towards Jerusalem and he prayed. He spoke to God, his Lord, his friend and his treasure. Now why was he so calm? I believe the answer is because Daniel knew that God was sovereign that it was not Darius or the plotters who were in control, even if it looked like that. I believe because Daniel knew that God had a plan. You would not have caught Daniel buying a lottery ticket at a garage. Daniel balked at the idea of the pagan gods, of chance, of fortune and superstition. Because if one thing is clear from the book of Daniel, it is that God is in control and that God has an articulated plan for mankind. We read about that plan in Daniel 2. Before I get to that, in other words, even now, in these times where we have COVID and lockdown and people dying and illness, God is still in control. In Daniel chapter 2, we remember Nebuchadnezzar's dream. In his dream stood a large statue, enormous, dazzling and awesome. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. Daniel tells us that the statue represents four kingdoms. Daniel tells us the first kingdom represents the Babylonian Empire. As the head of gold is no one other than our sleepless King Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2. We know from history that Babylonian Empire was taken over by the Medo-Persian Empire. The Medo-Persian Empire was taken over by the Greek Empire and the Greek Empire was replaced by the Roman Empire. The second part of the dream, and this is really important, is about the rock that smashes the statue. And in this dream, a rock was cut out but not of human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed it. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. Total annihilation of all human kingdoms by the rock. This rock, I tell you today, and I hope it brings you great comfort, is no one other than Jesus Christ himself. His kingdom will endure forever. So humanity's existence is not a missile out of control spiraling towards any spot it may hit. If you're a Christian, you do not have the luxury to blame history on bad luck or chance or whatever. 
because the book of Daniel tells you that God ha does have a fixed plan for the history of humankind. Human history runs along the pattern set there by God. So surely, if God has a plan for humankind, then he must have a plan for me and for you. Why do I say that? Because my life is inextricably part of human history, and it must then accordingly be a subcomponent of the bigger plan. That means that whatever happens in your life, whether good or bad, will still fit into the bigger plan. It has to. And adding to this, nothing that has happened in your life, life, whether good or bad, has happened without God knowing and without God allowing it to happen. The sovereignty of God engulfs you and me. It's like a cool blue sea. It's like the rock of Gibraltar in its stability. Because whatever may happen, whatever may befall you, whatever you may cause by your sinful decisions, whether you live or die, whether you are in the cancer ward or in remission, whether good happens or bad, God is still in control and He will always be in control. He is in control of the happenings in South Africa. He is in control of COVID. He is in control of everything. If there are conspiracies happening, He's even in control of them. Because God is sovereign and His sovereignty engulfs you and me. It's like a cool blue sea. It's like the rock of Gibraltar. Another thing you would have noticed from the text that Daniel had the habit and discipline of praying. But this does raise with us the following important question, some deeper theology. Why pray if God is sovereign and he has already decided what the plan is? What difference would it make if I prayed? God has already planned the history of humankind. How does God's sovereignty and our prayer find each other? Now this question has perplexed and perplexes many Christians. And it often leads to prayer paralysis. So we need to understand the tension between God's sovereignty and our life. The first thing we must understand is that it is because God is sovereign that our prayer life has any meaning. It is because God controls history that we have any hope of our prayer having any meaning. It is because God is sovereign that we have the confidence that He can answer our prayers. And the mystery is how our prayers are interwoven in His plans for mankind. The second thing that we must understand is this, that God Himself has made space for prayer. It's not us bothering God while he indifferently manages his plans. He's not busy making universes, as I said in a previous sermon, and beryllium and the like. He wants us to pray. God wants you to pray. May I put it this way? The fullness of his plan for your life, the church and mankind, lies through prayer. Remember the prayer of Jabez, recorded for us in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 to 10. Now Jabez, or Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bore him in pain. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me, and that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. So listen to this. God granted him what he requested. Jabez prayed and God granted the request. That alone must make us sit up straight. God does grant requests. God does answer prayers. And I have no doubt that God granted the request because Jabez desired to glorify God. God blessed Jabez. May I ask how different is Daniel's blessing? God granted Daniel the very same things. He blessed Daniel. He enlarged the area of Daniel's authority. God's hand was with Daniel. God kept him from evil so that Daniel did not cause pain. So there is absolutely no biblical doubt that certain blessings for you and for me and for others will only be unlocked through prayer. It's also clear that certain elements in God's greater plan can only be unlocked by prayer. Douglas Kelly 
puts it this way. Although Jesus assures us in John chapter 16 verse 33 that he has overcome the world, the prayers of ordinary people like Jabez and you and me have a real place. They are the primary means of bringing his victory to bear in matters that affect us individually, as well as throughout the whole range of national and international affairs. Prayer releases blessing, changes lives, builds up churches, assaults the devil, and brings revival to communities, even to nations. So what I want us to notice is that God is sovereign. He has a plan, and that plan will happen, but that we play a role in activating the plan through prayer and calling down blessings upon us to the fullness of that plan. And if you are in the right place, you are not seeking blessings from God for yourself, but for His glory. But it is also good and right to desire to be satisfied by God and to pursue that. Piper, John Piper, I believe, still has it right when he says that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. Are you satisfied in God? Do you have composure in the circumstances that you're facing today? Have you continued in your walk with God? Have you followed Him? Have you had the composure that tells people that you know God is sovereign and God is in control. Daniel sought first the glory of God. That is what made him tick. And he prayed and God blessed him and God was glorified. That is why King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth and said this, May you prosper greatly. I issue the decree that in every part of my kingdom people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. I close. Daniel's faith is something simply to admire. He was taken from his home at the age of 14 to the Babylonian Empire. He had lived in two empires. He had lived under the rule of three different kings. He had seen fashions and lifestyles change. And in all of this he had always been steady, always been composed. He had been God's man. He had done what God had asked. He had done justice. He had loved kindness. He had walked humbly with God in prayer and in action. The first six chapters of the book of Daniel asks this. Will you do the same? Will you today be God's man or God's woman? May God bless you in this. Let us close our eyes and join in prayer. Father, we pray by your grace for composure in the midst of the disaster that is COVID and the troubles in our country. We ask by your grace that we will be faithful as Daniel was, that we would take practical decisions to spend time with you in prayer, to turn our hearts and eyes resolutely upon you. May you grant us, Lord, that our lives will show justice and kindness and humility. May others see in us your glory, and may you thereby be glorified. I pray, Father, for us maturity, depth, insight, stability. May we shine, Lord, in a crooked time. May we be of the nature that is pleasing to you. I ask that you will heal broken hearts, Lord, that you will strengthen us for your work, and that your kingdom may go forth mightily. And I pray this today in the mighty and glorious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen.